You might want to mark that song just in case. You never know with wires and computers this day. And by the way, if anybody, before anybody asks, it is not a Mac problem. It is a wiring problem. So I just want to get that out of the way. I would encourage you to open up in your Bibles to Matthew, the seventh chapter. Once you get there, know that you can stay there. We're going to be in the Gospels the entire lesson. We're not going to venture outside of the Gospels. We'll bounce around inside of it, Matthew, Luke, and John primarily. But we'll kind of use Matthew 7 as our home base as we explore what is, in my opinion, a very important subject. The idea of Jesus being narrow-minded and whether or not he was, in fact, narrow-minded. I think that's that's a very important concept for us to talk about. I appreciate, as I mentioned in the class, the men that took part in worship, uh, Wiley and Ken and also Zach, for uh, preaching for us while we were gone last week. I don't know if it was where we went or just the fact that quarantine made us all stare at each other inside of a house for the last year and a half, but it felt really, really good to get out of town for a few days. And I know everybody that's been able to travel has enjoyed that as well. We're actually going to be gone a couple more times. More uh, Two weeks from now, we'll be gone uh, in a meeting just down the road in Sulphur Springs, and then in July. We'll be going again on vacation. This time will be just me and Melina. And then that's it for the rest of the year. And so you'll get a lot of other people for the next couple of months, but then you'll have to deal with me until 2022. Uh, I always like travel. And thankfully, because of my job, I've been actually very blessed to do quite a bit of travel and not so much domestically as much as overseas. I've been overseas a few times and I love it. I love going overseas and meeting people from different countries. And especially as we just sang, sang about preaching the gospel wherever we go and talking to people from different cultures and talking about uh, talking about the gospel. But I cannot, unfortunately, sleep on airplanes. And so if you're one of those types of people that can't sleep in transit, especially if you're on these long international flights, what you know is that there is always inevitably on every long international flight, especially if it's overnight, there's always a group of people at the back that always just stand around and talk. And these are a collection of people from all corners of the world, literally. They're usually hanging out by the stewardesses where they can snack and stuff like that. And it was one of these trips to the Philippines. I think Zach was on this trip as a matter of fact, I don't know if he was back there with us, but it was on one of these trips and I was back there, it was in the middle of the night and I'm snacking on some crackers and probably the same can of Coke that I've been drinking for the whole rest of the flight. And I'm talking to one of these guys and I don't know if this guy was a religious person, I don't know what he did for a living, but inevitably when I told him what we were going to do, which was to go over for two weeks to the Philippines to preach for a little while, inevitably the conversation turned to religion. And so he started talking to us about Christianity and what it meant to be baptized. And we talked about whether or not Jesus was any better than Buddha and whether or not Buddha had any amounts of ounce of truthfulness in his teachings and where Confucius fit in and whether Islam was really going to be a global power. All that stuff that you talk about when you don't really know what time zone you're in. And I remember inevitably after probably an hour or so of this conversation, he looked at me and he said, and it was to all of us, not just me, but he looked at us and he said, you know, boys, and he was I think 20 or 30 years older than us. He said, you know, boys, I think that if you got outside of your own way and expanded your mind a little bit, you would see things a little clearer. And I've thought about that statement a lot throughout the years. And I make no mistake about what we're talking about. I am a big fan of expanding your mind. I'm a big fan of reading wide. I know some preachers just like to stay within their kind of core discipline and just read Bible books. I don't roll that way. I like to read a lot of different things. I think there's a lot of useful wisdom in the world. I think there's a lot of useful things we can glean from history and from science and math. So I am a big fan of reading wide. I'm a big fan of expanding our minds to reach in different cultures and see what other people have come up with. But at some point, ladies and gentlemen, there has to be some tracks that we're on. At some point, there has to be some kind of railing that keeps us in before wandering off the deep end. We all know of people that have started off and seem to be so zealous for God and seem to be so zealous for the Bible. And then for whatever reason, and maybe it's people, maybe it's influences, whatever, it just seems like they end up with some pretty wacky kind of ideas. And all that tells me is that there has to be an importance in understanding that there are rails, there are guidelines, but that's not how most of the world operates. Whenever you say, I live by the Bible, I die by the Bible, I obey the Bible, I read the Bible, study the Bible, that is my dictum for life, inevitably the question or the accusation rather comes up that you are just being narrow-minded and that you can, in essence, understand life just by the pages of Scripture. You have to read other things in order to get the most out of life. Once again, not against reading other things, but that you can't read just what it says inside of Scripture and really understand what life is all about. I would disagree with that, primarily because Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 that God has given us all things according to life and godliness. So I would disagree with it, at least on that front. But that accusation, I'll always remember what that guy said, that if you just expanded your mind just a little bit, 
then you would truly see what life is all about. And I want to challenge that just a little bit and kind of look at that. I'm not here to say that that accusation was wrong. I'm not here to say that that's a horrible way of looking at the world. But I want to challenge that assumption that anybody who lives and obeys the Bible is inherently narrow-minded. In Matthew the seventh chapter, for instance, verse 24, you can see at least what Jesus thought about his own authority when he says here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house in the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Do you hear what Jesus is saying in that passage? What Jesus is saying is, is that there has to be some kind of foundation by which we live our life on. And I don't care what you claim to be, or I don't care how spiritual or unspiritual the world claims to be, everybody needs some kind of foundation. And what Jesus is saying in this passage is that foundation should be the words that I'm speaking to you, the words that God is speaking to you through Scripture. And so Jesus makes no mistakes or makes no bones about the fact that he views his words and the words in Scripture as foundational to life itself, primarily because what it says about that. When the winds blew and the storms came and the house falls apart, because it really wasn't built on anything solid. If you want to build your house on something solid, build it on the words of Scripture. And so Jesus doesn't really take kind with this idea that there's all these different competing philosophies about worldviews and life and things like that, and that they're all equal. He doesn't feel it like that. He views the words of Scripture, primarily the words of God, which are all words of Scripture. All of those scripture words of Scripture are words of God. I don't know what I meant by that. All the words of Scripture as that foundation by which we should live our life. And I would argue, too, that Jesus, contrary to what a lot of people think about him, was actually very narrow-minded in his viewpoint. Primarily when it comes to something like authority. You know, in the world today, you have a lot of people that don't like the word authority. Authority is kind of this dirty word because we don't like to be held back. And I've made this point before, but as Americans, and especially as Texans, we don't like authority. Because we like to just kind of strap our six-shooters on, and we like to go into the Old West and start blazing. And we do that primarily on Facebook, by the way. We like to just kind of go out into the world and just kind of live by however we want to. Nobody's going to tell me what I'm going to do. And so anytime you talk to anybody about the idea of authority, it inherently keeps with it the idea of somebody keeping you down. Paul challenges that in Galatians when he talks about liberty through the gospel. But nevertheless, there has to be some kind of authority by which we live our life. The Unitarian Universalist Church, by the way, which is one of those denominations that tries to be everything to everybody. The one thing that says everybody is the same, everybody can come to faith in their own way. Listen to what they have to say. They list their doctrines literally, and this is straight from their website, as Jewish and Christian teachings, certainly, but also spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature as well as wisdom from the world's religions which inspire us in our ethical and spiritual life. Did you notice that? What the Unitarian Universalist Church claim and those people who ascribe to this type of teaching claim doctrine literally is everything. That doctrine is whatever Buddha put together. That doctrine is whatever Jesus put together. That doctrine is just kind of this massive hodgepodge of all the beliefs that the world has to offer. We kind of pick and choose. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not authority. Authority cannot be everything. Authority cannot be something that allows us to do anything we want. Authority, by its very nature, gives us a path to walk down. It tells us what is authoritative and what's not. And when you look, for instance, at Matthew, the fifth chapter, look a couple chapters earlier than what we were reading a second ago. When you look at Matthew, chapter 5, Jesus is very emphatic that he is the authority. And this is one of the things that I love about Jesus' teachings. And it's something I think that's at least a lesson for me. I'm sure it's a lesson for a lot of us. But I think it's a very powerful lesson that Jesus never, ever, ever backs down from who he is. You know, if you walked around teaching like Jesus taught, and now obviously none of us are God, but if we were to walk around teaching as Jesus taught, we would probably be stoned, we would probably be beaten, we'd be persecuted, because he's so almost arrogant in the way that he puts forth. And Jesus is not arrogant. 
hypocrites. He would be if he weren't God. But Jesus never backs down from telling people who he is. In Matthew chapter 5, for instance, look at verse 21. He says, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Jesus says, two parts of this. Number one, you have heard blank. But I'm telling you something different. And really what he's doing here in this passage is he's giving the fulfillment of what these passages actually meant. But what essentially he's doing in real time to these people is he's saying you have this understanding about God and this understanding about law and all these different things, but I'm telling you something more. And that's what you need to follow. If I preach that, if I said that, if we walked around and said to everybody else, oh I know you've been told this, but this is really what I think is important then none of us would last five seconds. But Jesus has that authority. He doesn't back down from it. If you look in verse 27, for instance, he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He does this a few more times. Verse 31, it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. They're going to have arguments about that 14 chapters from now. And look in verse 33. Again, you have heard the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. I say to you, verse 34, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, by earth, for it is the footstool of our feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Jump down to verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot get past the Sermon on the Mount, and especially chapter 5, without having a very real, visceral understanding of Jesus' authority that he understands he has. Nobody else has that. And that's why when you look at Matthew chapter 23 and he rails against all of these people that claim to be great prophets or great rabbis or great teachers, he says, don't listen to those people. You have one king, that's God. You have one brother, that's me. You have one teacher, not these other people. There are all sorts of people in this world who claim to have all sorts of authority and say, you should listen to me because X, Y, and Z. You should do this because of I believe that this is best. And all of those people fall flat. Interestingly enough, when you look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 through 29, this point is just really drilled home. Because it says, when he had finished these words, the crowd was amazed at his teaching. Listen to this. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. That's not how I teach, ladies and gentlemen. And those of you who are in charge of teaching other people is probably not how you teach either. Because the authority that he's talking about here in verse 29 is not authority that's vested from somebody else, but it's authority that comes from himself. Nobody else can talk like that. And that's why verse 28 talks or says that what it does. That they were amazed at his teaching because he was teaching as somebody that had authority, not as just somebody who was reiterating things that they had been taught and regurgitating points that they pulled out of thin air. Jesus was very narrow-minded in the belief that he had authority. And that's, I think, something that we should all kind of take to the bank. Let me ask you this. Let me tell you this, too. Jesus was narrow-minded in his view on discipleship. Let me ask you this question. What does it mean in today's world to be a disciple? You know, in today's world, you have a lot of people, and, he, and even we can fall, absolutely fall victim to this as well. But in today's world, you, talk, you hear a lot of the religious buzzwords that all kind of center around the idea of discipleship. And I agree with that. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28, go into all the world, baptizing them, but most importantly, making disciples. And so the idea of discipleship is something that we should be focusing on. But what does it mean to be a disciple? Does it mean that we show up to services twice a year? Does it mean that we have the little fish insignia on the back of our car? What does it mean to actually be a disciple? To be a disciple means, first and foremost, to bow to the authority in your life. You, the whole idea of a disciple is that you're following a master, you're following somebody else. And so discipleship, even though it's used so popularly and so all over the place by all these different things, discipleship is literally something that requires our full devotion. If you remember when David is standing before 
um, the threshing floor, when he's standing before the threshing floor after the census, he says, I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. That should be our understanding of discipleship. That we're not going to offer to God anything that doesn't cost us anything. If you look in Luke, the ninth chapter, in verse 57, this is the old standby when it comes to discipleship. Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 57. It says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. All of us, if we're Christians, have made a similar declaration. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to them, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That last verse in 62 says everything about this. And it honestly says everything about discipleship. Because what Jesus is teaching here in this passage is, it's one thing to say that you're a disciple. It's quite another to be a disciple disciple. And all three of these people, to their own certain extent, their own individual ways, didn't really fully understand what it meant to be a disciple. Being a disciple of God not only encompasses all of our hearts, but it encompasses our mind and our strength and our spirit as well. It encompasses our whole being. It's one of the reasons why we don't have just a blanket checklist of things to do. At 9 o'clock do this, 9.30 do this, 10.30 do this. It encompasses everything about who you are. How you interact with people. How we talk to people. Jesus has a very narrow definition of discipleship because at least in one occasion, He dictated who was going to be His disciple individually and who was not going to be His disciple individually. And we can say all day long, and I probably know that a lot of us have people in our lives that claim to be a disciple. And maybe we even claim to be a disciple. The question is, are we actually a disciple? Because a disciple encompasses more than just posting something on Facebook in order to receive. If you get 10 likes, you get blessings. That's how it always works. It encompasses more than just reading your Bible every day. It talks about how you treat people. What you think about God. What you're doing when nobody is watching. Those types of stuff. And that's why when you look at his passage in Luke, the 14th chapter, in verses 25 through 27, it makes a lot of sense. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 27. It says, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Not won't be my disciple. Cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then you have that grand discussion in verse 28 down through the end of that section about counting the cost. And surely all of us as we're Christians, all of us who are Christians today have at some point counted the cost and thought to ourselves, this is what a life of discipleship is actually going to look like. It's going to require sacrifices on my part. It may require losing some relationships that I hold very dear. It may require losing some ha ha habits that I hold very near and dear to my heart. It will also gain a close relationship with the creator of the universe and the hope that only Christians can have. But you have to weigh that out. As Joshua said at the end of his book, he said, choose you for this day whom you will serve. Nobody's going to twist your arm and make you be a disciple. But once you saddle up to be a donkey, or <laughs> to be a disciple, I was thinking of saddling up a donkey for some reason. <laughs> Once you saddle up and become a disciple, you have to know what it requires. And that's why I think where the rubber meets the road a lot with our friends in the world who say, well, I'm a disciple. And it's not always for me to say, well, are you? Because that's always a very antagonistic conversation. But if you, somebody says they're a disciple and they don't live like one, then there seems to be a disconnect there. And it's the same is true for our lives. Discipleship is not about just being here on Sundays. It's not just about shaking hands and saying that you're good and answering a few questions in class, taking communion and going out the door. It's about every part of our life. It's a very narrow definition, but it's narrow on purpose. Jesus dictated what discipleship was, and he was very explicit about it. I would also tell you that Jesus was very narrow-minded in his view of false teachers. Now, I'm not one of those people that thinks you need to walk around in every sermon. You need to call out at least five people that are false teachers. I don't roll like that. I do believe, however that it's very easy to spot a false teacher. Because primarily when you look at it the way that Jesus describes it in Matthew the 7th chapter, it's not just about what they say, but it's about what they do. In Matthew the 7th chapter, starting in verse 15, listen to what he says here. He says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. 
You will know them, verse 16, by their fruits. I love that situation. Not the situation, but I love his understanding of the situation. Because the question comes up, how do we know false teachers? How do we know to beware of them? You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes and figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is then cut down and thrown in the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. It's very easy to spot them if we're looking for it. Because what you'll see in somebody who claims to be a disciple, who claims to be walking by God's authority, is a life that reflects that. In a teaching that reflects that. And this is honestly the whole reason why Jesus has such a narrow-minded opinion of authority and discipleship because of false teachers like this who want to say that everything's okay. And if everything is okay, then nothing is ever punished. Vis a vis, nothing is ever rewarded either. Jesus has a narrow understanding of what authority means. He has a very narrow understanding of what discipleship is because a lot of people don't. It would be very easy for anybody to get up in this pulpit and just talk about how all of us are going to heaven and how it doesn't really matter what you do in life and how it doesn't really matter what you believe because after all, God came to save everybody and I do believe in grace and I do believe in mercy. But the reality of it is, is those people that do that are just peddling false hope because they're not helping us be disciples. If you look at what he says right after this in verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Can you imagine saying that to anybody in the world right now? That it's not just about people who say, Lord, Lord, but those who do the will of their Father. Many will say to me on that day in verse 22, Lord, Lord, didn't we do what you asked? Didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's not just about doing the things, but doing the right things. Doing them for the right reasons. Doing them with the right motivation. If I get up here and preach the gospel all day long, but I'm doing it because I can't do anything else in this life, which no jokes from anybody. But if I just get up here because this is quote unquote an easy job, then the content may be the same. But I believe the judgment from God will be different. We always have to wonder about why we're doing things. Ask ourselves the questions. What is my motivation? What is my purpose in all of this? In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 8. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 8. This is what we've alluded to now twice this morning. He says, Don't be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you're all brothers. Don't call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father. He was in heaven. Don't be called leaders, for one's your leader. That is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. People like back then operate the exact same way they do now. We love giving ourselves titles. We love giving ourselves authority stamps. We love giving ourselves praise among other people. He says, don't buy into any of that. And if we had any reason to wonder why we shouldn't buy into it, chapter 23 in a nutshell dictates that reason. Look in verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you don't enter in yourselves, and nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him, listen to this, twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. You know, we sometimes wonder when you look at Jesus' earthly ministry that started around the age of 30 and ended when he was 33 and a half. Why was it that he was murdered by a monkey trial inside of three and a half years? Well, it's stuff like this. It's because he had the gall to walk up to what he knew was false teachers and tell them exactly what they were doing in the broad view of everybody that were being exposed to those false doctrines. A lot of people didn't like him. A lot of people claim in today's world that Jesus was their best friend, that he's their teacher, their master. And when we say that, sometimes we escape the notice that we're doing the exact same thing that these people were. That we're traveling around on sea and land to make a proselyte. And when we do, we're really just making him twice as much a son of hell as ourselves. Primarily because our motives are not pure. The things that we're teaching are not pure. That's why James says in James chapter 3, Let not many of you become teachers, for you will incur a stricter judgment. That's exactly what he's talking about in this passage. False teachers are the ones that he calls out more often than anything else because of their influence on everyday people. And we need to have that same courage to do what Jesus did. 
Finally, Jesus was narrow-minded in his view of salvation. Look at Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse 13. Matthew, chapter 7, and verse 13. Two verses in this passage, in this entire section that should scare us probably than just about any other part of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13. He says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. There are many who enter through it. Verse 14, For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. In two verses, Jesus completely demolishes every unitary and universalist, faith-only salvation on the planet because he dictates the idea that salvation is not going to be as wide as many people think. There are a lot of voices during the fall of Jerusalem that said that God would never come in and destroy the temple. And there are only a few that we knew about that said God's judgment will reach Jerusalem. And those few voices were the ones that were right. And there are a lot of people in today's world that say you can live however you want to live and you can do whatever you want to do. And it doesn't matter because God loves everybody. God does love everybody. But he also expects those people to live like they love him. Jesus has a very narrow viewpoint of salvation. And these two verses should scare us half to death, not because we're worried necessarily that we're on the broad path and don't even know it, but it should cause us to constantly re-examine our lives and ask ourselves, am I truly doing what God wants me to do? Am I truly on the path to salvation? Or am I off the rails somewhere? He magnifies this thought in passages like John the third chapter. And this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, in my opinion, is, is one of the most insightful when it comes to religion. Because Jesus is not dealing, and I'm saying this very tongue-in-cheek, He's not dealing with an everyday person. He is dealing in John the third chapter by somebody who is a self-proclaimed ruler of the Jews. And that's the title that they gave Him. It's somebody whose entire job was to study the Bible day in and day out. And to read it and to talk about it with other people and to tell other people how to be right with God. And so in John the third chapter, when Nicodemus very humbly approaches Jesus and asks for his opinion about things, Jesus answers in verse 3 and says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's a declarative statement. But then in verse 4, Nicodemus then said to him, How can this be? How can a man be born when he is old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered and said again, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus expounds on that idea throughout John chapter 3. But he begins with the central understanding that there is a gate. That it's not something that is just widely available, that everybody can meander in through a back door and you can crawl through a window. He says there is a gate. And unless you are born again of water and the Spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's not a popular opinion. But it is the only opinion that matters. It's the only doctrine that matters. And it's the only teaching that matters. And if I were to get up here, and anybody else were to get up here and say, well, this is the way to salvation. Well, what are you basing that off of? I didn't create heaven. I didn't die for your sins. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1. None of this was made available by me or any other man. The only person that has the right to dictate the way to salvation is the one who died to make that salvation possible. That's what Jesus himself says in John chapter 14. I go to make a home for you. That's the purpose of this. Because of that, he can say things like John chapter 3 and verses 3 through 5. It's always interesting when you talk to people, and you probably talk to other people, different people than I do, but we all have conversations like this. We all have conversations with people about God and about prayer and all these different things. And I would challenge you at some point to walk up to somebody that you know is religious. And in a, as non-confrontational, I'm not trying to start any fights. In a non-confrontational way, just get to the question, what do you think you need to do to be saved? And there might be some him hawing around. There might be some towing the party line from both sides, honestly. But ultimately, when it comes down to it, what people think about the way to heaven is forms every part of their character. And if you believe that you can do anything you want, if you believe you can say anything you want, if you believe that you can live by your own rules, then that conversation will reveal that, just as it will reveal it to us. We all need to know, above anything else, what it takes to become a child of God. We all need to know whether or not we're right with God every second of every day. Not to be neurotic about it. But Paul says in Corinthians, test yourselves, examine yourselves, see if you're in the faith. It's very easy for us, especially in churches, to kind of get away from this. And say, yeah, I know that Jesus is narrow-minded in His view of authority and discipleship and false teachers and salvation. And those are good lessons for people out there. Ladies and gentlemen, these are good lessons for us in here as well. As we think about whether or not we're living 
by the standards, the very lofty standards that Jesus set up for us to live by. And if we're not living by them, then I would encourage you to re-examine your life and to reorient your life so that we live according to the way that Jesus told us to do. After all, His opinion is the only one that matters. His doctrine is the only one that counts. And if you need help with that, whether that's baptism or helping to get prayers to get your life back on the right track, we can do that. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing?